Good day. I'm Arlene Bloom from the Green Science Policy Institute, and I'm so happy to be speaking with you now from Berkeley, California. I want to start by thanking the organizers, the UBA, and the BMU, who've done such a fantastic job of putting together this very informative agenda, and I'm really looking forward to the meeting. I so wish we were all in Berlin together, but that's not possible. Next year might be better, I would assume. So um, I'm a biophysical chemist and a mountain climber, and indeed, um, one of the things I'm known for is leading the first American ascent of Annapurna One, which is considered perhaps the most dangerous and possibly the hardest to climb of the world's 8,000 meter peaks. And um, what we're doing now together, trying to reduce the use of PFAS and other harmful chemicals in our products, in our environment, in our bodies, I think is more challenging and more important than climbing the world's highest mountains. And very similar, I think we're all on an expedition together and our objective is clearly a healthier world. And I think the meetings today and tomorrow are going to help us achieve our goal. So um, I'm gonna be sharing some of what I know with you now. I look forward to questions at the end and so today I'm going to be speaking with you about reducing harm from PFAS for a healthier environment. Our organization, the Green Science Policy Institute, are scientists who write scientific papers. We bring together decision makers, both from government and from business, as well as NGOs and academics. And we communicate our research and the ideas we get from our partners to change both government policy, and we work with manufacturers and retailers to change business purchasing. Uh, as I said, I'm a mountain climber, and years ago, uh, a friend died climbing, and it made, who was an early environmentalist, and it made me want to do something for the environment, and I learned that most children's sleepwear in the U.S. was 10% by weight, brominated tris flame retardant. And we did an experiment when a child got wore the pajamas, the brominated tris metabolites could be found in the child's urine immediately. Um, so we realized that the chemicals went from the pajamas into the child and we ran mutagenicity screens and determined that they were mutagenic, quite likely carcinogenic. I was just about to write a paper on this and I got invited to climb Mount Everest. No American woman had ever had that opportunity before. So while I was climbing steep ice faces and going across crevasses and up in the great coom of Everest, every night I got to camp and worked on my paper. Uh, this is my high point on Everest at 24-5, and my flag had a, a petri dish with no tris, a few number of colonies, and with a lot of tris flame retardant many more bacterial colonies. So from there, we set the paper by runner from Everest Base Camp to Kathmandu. It was published in Science Magazine as a lead article a few months later. And the topic of this um, paper, I think, says a lot about what we do at our institute. If you think about how most scientific papers end, it's by calling for more study. Uh, we said the main flame retardant in children's pajamas is a mutagen and should not be used. And when scientists make strong statements like that, things can happen. And back in those days, brominated tris was banned from children's garments, but it was replaced with chlorinated tris. And chlorinated tris turns out to have similar structure, function, and toxicity to brominated tris. And that's what you call a regrettable substitute which we will talk more about. So I wrote a book um, about climbing Annapurna, um, which was actually translated into German. So I took a picture of the German cover for you. And then I wrote a book about how I got to Annapurna, about my science and my climbing. And the book ended with me 15 years ago, not quite sure what I was going to do next. I'd just finished raising a family, writing my book, 
And then I learned that the same tryst that we had removed from children's pajamas was back in America's Furniture. And I'll talk more about that at the closing session, but that story brought me back to science and helped me to found our institute. So a big problem is that there are tens of thousands of industrial chemicals, and it takes a really long time to get information and to regulate them. You're doing a better job in the EU with REACH than we are in America, but it's still a long and slow process going one by one through tens of thousands of chemicals. So at our institute, we came up with the idea of thinking about these chemicals in classes or families that had similar structure and function. And we came up with six classes that contain a big chunk of the harmful chemicals in everyday products. Uh, PFAS, antimicrobials, flame retardants, bisphenols and phthalates, some solvents, and certain metals. And you can watch a four-minute video about each of these classes, which says where you can find them, what the harm is, and how you can reduce your exposure. So in half an hour, you can learn a lot about them all at sixclasses.org. I encourage you to do so. So if chemicals are in these classes, it doesn't mean we shouldn't ever use them. Some of them are very useful. But it's a red flag. It's a warning. We should say, is this chemical really necessary? Is it worth it? If you say to a mom, you can put a stain repellent chemical on your carpet that will make it possible for you to drop red wine and chocolate ice cream on the carpet, she might think that's a good idea. But she might not think so if you said the chemicals could be in her children's bodies for years and on the planet forever causing harm. She might decide to have a dark gray carpet, or if she really wants that white carpet, then ask for a really safer alternative chemical, and that's where green chemistry comes in. A second problem with these chemicals is they take us out of the circular economy, which Europe is taking the lead on and is so very, very important. Um, once you put any of these six classes in your products, they are not going to be reused, recycled. Unfortunately, they will end up being incinerated or landfilled, which is really not what we want. So I'm going to start today with my favorite class, because I think it's the worst, <laughs> PFAS, which we'll talk about. And uh, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, the AS word, and uh, two kinds of PFAS. They're called C8, because there's eight carbons. Uh, one is called PFOA, because there's a carboxylic acid at the end, eight carbons with carboxylic acid. Another is called PFOS, P-F-O-S, with a sulfonic group at the end. And these Eight carbon molecules were the main PFAS used from when they were discovered uh, more than 50 years ago and, until the present. And, well, not till the present, till they were phased out, I apologize, in 2015. Uh, the harm had been known since the 60s, so it took about 50 years from when the harm was first known to when we stopped using them. And, and the reason they're so useful and so harmful, it's the same. It's a very, very strong bond between carbon and fluorine, one of the strongest bonds in the periodic table. So it leads to their oil and water repellency, but it also leads to them being forever chemicals. They, they last for geologic time. Uh, I first learned about them trekking in Nepal with Anna Sharman, a, a Swedish chemist who studies PFAS back in 2012 and reading a book, Stain-Resistant, Nonstick, Waterproof, and Lethal, The Hidden Dangers of C8, about um, in the Ohio River Valley, uh, a Teflon plant, um, what the manufacture of Teflon led to the contamination of the drinking water uh, of tens of thousands uh, of people. And the subject came to public attention, uh, 3M, who is a big manufacturer, uh, wanted to do blood tests, and they wanted some blank blood that didn't have PFAS. They went to the local blood banks, and everyone's blood seemed to have PFAS in it. And based on that, um, they phased out of making C8. However, they moved to C4, which seems to have similar properties and similar potential for harm. 
so the Ohio River Valley story is made into a, a wonderful film, Dark Waters. If you haven't seen it, uh, the story of an attorney uh, played by movie star Mark Ruffalo with movie star Anne Hathaway is his wife, who uncovered the contamination in the Ohio River Valley, uh, filed lawsuits, won, and used the money to pay for epidemiology studies of about 40,000 uh, residents of the Ohio Valley. And from those studies, learned that these chemicals are linked to two kinds of cancer, high cholesterol, obesity, and a variety of other health problems. And of course, they're in nearly all of us. So C8 was indeed phased out due to its persistence, bioaccumulation, toxicity, and the replacement is C6, a regrettable substitute. Very similar structure, function, and unfortunately, potential for harm. Uh, also, never breaks down, uh, doesn't accumulate as much in humans, but does uh, build up in plants. Uh, the toxicity is being found in C6. Uh, they're smaller, so they move faster. There are many more of them, so they're harder to measure and monitor. And filtration that takes out the C8 does not, in many cases, remove the C6. So not, not such a big improvement. Um, scientists, meanwhile, knew about the problem, wanted to alert people uh, in 2014, a group of European scientists published the Helsinger Statement. Um, the next year, uh, building on that, we published the Madrid Statement in Environmental Health Perspectives, signed by several hundred scientists. Maybe some of you signed the Helsinger uh, or Madrid Statement. If I were there in person, I'd ask you to raise your hands, but we can't do that today. Uh, the statements. Uh, called on the international community to limit the production and use uh, of PFAS. And when we published the Madrid Statement, we did a lot of press. We really worked on getting the word out. And, and people began to discover there was a problem. Um, and they began to put some pressure on the EPA to set a level, a health advisory level, that was safe. Um, meanwhile, some EPA scientists who were in our um, science and policy monthly discussion group, which any of you would be very welcome to join. We, we started it at 2012 when we got back from trekking and it's been having a, a call every month ever since. So in our discussion group, I said, I wonder if we can trace back from places where the EPA has found high levels of PFAS in, in drinking water to the sources. And Elsie Sunderland had a student, Cindy Hu, who did um, the mapping and found the sources were uh, chemical production sites, military and domestic airports, and wastewater treatment plants. And just as the paper was being completed, uh, the EPA set a health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion for the sum of PFO and VFOS. And given that, we were able to predict that 6 million Americans had contaminated drinking water with PFAS above the high health advisory level. And that started a lot, lot more interest in PFAS. So others have found the health advisory level to be lower. Here's a graph showing how it, what's considered safe continues to go down. New Jersey set a, a really um, well-documented level for PFOA of 14 parts per trillion. And now uh, a number of states, Michigan, New Hampshire, Washington, have been setting uh, their own levels, which have turned out to, to be relatively low. And um, they also have been doing monitor, finding uh, many, many more contaminated places. So based on these kinds of numbers, people have estimated as much as 100,000 100 million Americans have PFAS in, in their drinking water. A couple examples. Uh, in Michigan, uh, Wolverine manufacturer made hush puppy shoes with Scotchgard, which is PFAS, and dumped scrap leather into fields, which a suburb was built on the fields where well water had levels up to more than 800 times the EPA health advisory and local residents had the kinds of health problems uh, associated. 
There have been a lot of lawsuits in the United States. Uh, Wolverine Manufacturing uh, had to pay Michigan nearly $70 million earlier this year because of PFAS damage to the environment. And then um, Wolverine sued 3M, who is paying them $55 million. Uh, another um, sad kind of story we've heard several times is at Cannon Air Force Base uh, used firefighting foam that entered the groundwater. Uh, there were dairy cows um, on a farm adjacent, and the levels were uh, up to 12,000 parts per trillion in the water, and so high in the milk and the cows that the cows all had to be euthanized. And all that the military could do was give um, uh, drinking water to the farmer because uh, PFAS are not yet officially called hazardous substances here, here in the U.S. Water treatment is very expensive in um, North Carolina. A Camorris plant contaminated uh, a large area and to build a carbon filtration plant, which takes out mostly long chains, is $46 million. Um, to reverse osmosis, which will take out long and short chains, is twice as much, and they're each about $3 million a year to operate. So in summary, PFAS are problematic, difficult to clean up, and prevention is preferable. Let's not use products that contain PFAS unless they're essential. Uh, we wrote a paper in 2016 pointing out that uh, about 500 fast food wrappers we tested, about 40% contain PFAS. Then, as usual, we did a big communications campaign. Uh, people in the Senate wrote letters to the fast food industry inquiring about their use of, of PFAS, and things started to change. Uh, 2018, Washington State banned PFAS in food packaging. So did Maine, San Francisco. And recently, um, no PFAS is allowed in military meals ready to eat packaging. Uh, Denmark is the leader in all this. Denmark banned all PFAS in paper and paper broad food packaging, and I have to say the Danish co-op took the lead in, in making this happen. Carpeting is a major source, perhaps the largest source of children's exposure. Uh, we started working with the carpet industry, invited the major carpet companies to come to a meeting with scientists. They'd gone from C8 to C6, thought they'd solved the problem, we pointed out that actually C6 was really harmful, and the American carpet industry a couple years ago decided to move away from all PFAS and carpet, long chain, short chain, and they did. And indeed, uh, January 1st, the major manufacturers, all the carpeting was free of all PFAS, and we knew it had happened when Home Depot, a big retailer, advertised that it was phasing out uh, selling any rugs and carpets containing PFAS. And it was based on the industry learning about the science. So that is our model. Uh, Keen Shoes have a great story of their PFAS-free journey. They looked at all their Keen Shoes, found 101 places where there was some PFAS. And when they investigated, the PFAS was not even necessary in 70 of the locations, and they removed it. And then it took years of work to find replacements in the other 31 places, but they did, and they succeeded. And we believe other industries and companies can do the same. Um, a great example has been IKEA, who has been a leader. I think five years ago, they removed PFAS from virtually all their products um, based on the company's values. Crate and Barra, Levi Strauss, other companies followed suit, and then some of these companies had a little help from uh, advocacy from Greenpeace, but the result is no PFAS in these companies' products. As far as government, here in the U.S., um, our National Defense Authorization Act, our military budget is a pretty sure way to get things to happen because it passes, and we have worked with people uh, in the House and Senate to add um, to the NDAA a requirement that they stop using firefighting foam containing any PFAS. Uh, Sc Scandinavian countries, Australia have already done that. Um, it was very challenging in the U.S., but the 2020 uh, military budget requires the military to stop using PFAS. 
which is really a good thing. Uh, and great news, the Biden agenda is prioritizing PFAS. Um, in priorities, uh, they talk about designating PFAS as a hazardous substance. Uh, the EPA had done that, but it got held up at the White House for a year and has, had not reappeared. Uh, I think it will reappear setting levels for drinking water and, and uh, purchasing. There's, we hope in this year's National Defense Authorization uh, will pass that the military will not buy a range of products such as furniture and clothing containing any PFAS and they're supporting PFAS research. So good news, all these products are moving away from PFAS, carpeting, packaging, furnishings, outdoor gear, clothing, and very important firefighting foam. And I think in Europe, you're taking the lead. I was asked to talk about America. So I, I think you're way ahead of us. I, I know there's an initiative from Germany and the Scandinavian countries to stop all unessential uses of PFAS uh, in the next few years, which I think is so commendable and great leadership. If you want to know more, we have a website called PFAS Central. Uh, the scientists who are on our monthly calls, and there are about 100 of them who participate from time to time, uh, help keep us apprised of what's going on all over the world. So we have uh, the big news, whatever that is on PFAS from the press, uh, the most interesting scientific articles curated with a sentence explaining what's important, uh, PFAS policy, events, jobs, and I think most interesting is uh, our PFAS free page. That's the one people visit the most at the request of communities who'd been drinking contaminated water for up to decades, uh, they said, we want to buy keen shoes and a Kia, things that don't contain PFAS. Can you give us a list? So this is our effort to make a list. And we're not so sure about things in Europe. So if any of you would be so kind as to suggest other products or brands that are PFAS free that we could add to our list, we would be very, very appreciative. In conclusion, I'll remind you to check out sixclasses.org in half an hour to learn about the six classes of chemicals of concern. And uh, we send out monthly e-newsletters. If you'd like to uh, subscribe, any of our websites, uh, easy one, sixclasses.org slash newsletter. And if you have any questions or you'd like to talk about PFAS, I love to talk about PFAS, as you can tell. Uh, please do get in touch with me, Arlene, at greensciencepolicy.org. And I'll just end with our communication strategy. Uh, we believe science plus good communication, working with uh, government and business um, stakeholders can lead to really positive change and a healthier future with reduced use of PFAS. So I think that was a little time for questions now, and then at the end, uh, I'll be helping uh, facilitate a, a session on the way forward based on what we've learned over the next two days. Thank you so much for your attention.